In Proverbs chapter 19, we'll read verses 10 through 16 responsively. Proverbs chapter 19. Let's all read together on verse number 10 and then every other verse down through verse 16 here responsively this morning. Proverbs 19 verses 10 through 16. Delight is not seemly for a fool, much less for a servant to have rule over princes. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is, it is his glory to pass over a transgression. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but his favor is as dew upon the grass. A foolish son is the calamity of his father, and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul, but he that despiseth his ways shall die. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have given us your word, and Lord, that we hold in our hands this morning. I pray today that your Holy Spirit would take your word, move in our hearts, and Lord, fill our preacher with your spirit, and meet with us today, Lord, and strengthen us, encourage, and challenge, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name we ask this, amen, and thank you very much, you may be seated. Thank you, Brother Penn, and thank you all for, the, for my listening to your reading the word of God this morning. You know, that's something that is missing in so many churches today, is the public reading of God's word. And that's because in so many places, it's not that the Bible's not important, it's that they have introduced so many different so-called versions of the Word of God, and nobody has the same book. They can't read publicly out of it because the words are all different. And I, it's wonderful hearing the reading of God's Word aloud here. This morning's message has an unusual title, and that's not unusual for me. It's simply this, keep calm and... Keep calm and, well, I, the truth of the matter, I've seen that phrase so often in recent days. You drive by a restaurant and it says, keep calm and eat at our restaurant. <laughs> or keep calm, my favorite one is, and drink coffee. Uh, that's a good one. Uh, some carry very silly advice. Others carry very good advice. But uh, some of the ones that I've seen, keep calm and carry on. I thought that was a good one. Uh, keep calm and drink coffee. That's my favorite one of all of them. Uh, how many would say amen to that? Uh, there you go. Amen. There you go. Uh, keep calm and go back to sleep. That sounds pretty good right now for a lot of us. Uh, I saw one that said, keep calm and just breathe. That was good advice. I saw one that said, keep calm and trust God. That was a really good one. And on the list goes. And you've seen those same things, haven't you? When you've been out, uh, you don't have to travel far. I've seen them in Woodland Park. I've seen them down here in Colorado Springs area. I think I've seen them in Manitou. Uh, there's a lot to remain calm in Manitou Springs. What can I say? Uh, however, there is a wonderful truth that's found here in verse 11, as we read it a moment ago. And you have your Bibles there, and you will need them this morning. Uh, the passage is key to anger management. Uh, that is keeping calm, you see. Uh, you have noticed, as well as I have, we are living in a very angry age. And it's gotten angrier every single year. And I, I, I've often asked myself, why are people so angry? And I think the key, of course, is found in the Word of God. You can't, you can't argue with the Bible. I mean, it has the answer for everything. It does not matter uh, what the question is. The God Bible has the answer. And, of course, the answer for this type of uncontrolled anger that seems to be growing exponentially in our society, literally around the world. When you think about the, the cancel society that we're living in, everybody's mad at something. Somebody says ball teams are changing their names. Pancake syrup is changing its name. Rice that you cook with is changing its name because somebody got offended somewhere along the line and everybody gets angry and up in arms and they go downtown and they tear down statues and they knock down Ten Commandments and they burn down buildings and they break out windows and they steal television sets and they do all of these things because they are angry for one reason or another. 
As I saw a couple of years ago on the news, as a man stood above a crowd where he was so angry, he talked about burning the city down. And burn it, burn it down. And anger just everywhere you look. But we speak of that in society, but there's a lot of anger in our families today as well. Much anger in our families today, and far too much anger. There is a philosophy that says that a Christian should never get angry, but that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says the exact opposite of that, but it gives us instruction about being angry. And so it's interesting how we have this all turned around. And when husbands are angry with their wives, their wives are angry with their husbands, and they, they have no just cause for any of that, just live an angry life, and parents angry with their children, and children angry with their parents, and children angry with one another. We have, no angry, we have no anger management going on, it seems. But I believe the key to anger management is found in this one single verse. In fact, as I was re-preparing, uh, every Sunday morning I go through all of my notes that I'm going to use on Sunday. And I thought, you know, we were only going to read verse 11 and I was going to go from there. But when I got back to the church here, I wrote a note to Brother Penn and said that I wanted him to read a few more of the verses out of Proverbs. And so only God knows, listen, but the secret to controlling your anger is found in a single verse. Look at verse 11 again. And it's, it's amazing how it's just found written in the word of God. And how many times have you read through Proverbs? How many times have you read through Proverbs chapter 19? Or have you ever read through Proverbs 19? It says, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Obviously, this is talking about our relationships with others. Because talking about passing over a transgression. And when we get angry, it's very, very important. Now, understand what I'm saying. It's easy for us to judge impulsively. It really honestly is. Make a quick judgment on something we see, something we hear, something we don't understand. We don't have all the facts. The Bible even speaks of those who speak before they know all the facts as being foolish. They, they, they should not, pastors do that. It's not just, uh, it's just not folks that attend church that do that or families. Pastors do the same thing. They make a judgment before they hear both sides of an argument between individuals. And so we have here, uh, but listen, there are many folks who simply, uh, who appear to be bent that way where they judge impulsively another person's actions toward them. And in fact, it takes hardly anything to set them off. You've heard about people that have a short fuse. Well, there's a lot of people that have a short fuse. There's some folks that don't have a fuse at all. I mean, they're just a piece of C4 with an electrode sticking in it and waiting for somebody to press the button and blow it up. That's what they're waiting for. No fuse involved. And how sad it is when believers are driven by their feelings at a particular moment rather than having proper discretion, as the Bible would talk about. One might say, Pastor, this is not a typical Sunday morning message, is it? Are any of my messages ever typically Sunday morning? Amen. Absolutely not. Some of them may be, but you don't know which ones they were. In other words, Proverbs is teaching us that a proper understanding and godly wisdom will cause us to make a judgment in time rather than impulsively. And how important that is. Uh, I, I saw something the other day, and I, I know I've said this, and our good friend Brad, who lives down in Florida, uh, but I, I have a little, a little meme. It's actually a picture that came uh, with a computer program that we got long, 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 long time ago. And it's got a picture of a man standing there with his foot stuck in his mouth. And I've often said many people only open their mouth to change feet, and that's basically how many people are. And Brad wrote that. He put that little picture up, and he said, some people only open their mouth to change feet. I'm thinking he must have heard me preaching or something and copied that from me. But then again, that would be not an uncommon thing. And it will be to this individual's benefit who opens his mouth only to change feet. Uh, that is, uh, listen, uh, to simply get over things uh, that are done to him personally, to his praise, he could do that, learn how to do that. Now, we pastors are criticized because we will look at somebody and do the man thing. Get over it. People can't do that. They physically, humanly can't do that. And they know it. That's why we have to have help. And that's why the Bible gives us instruction in this. You see, everybody in this room this morning has a fallen human nature. 
And that always gets in the way. The Apostle Paul said, what I wish I would do, I don't. And what I shouldn't do, I do. And he says, I've got a will that won't leave me alone. He said, that will is present with me. He even recognized that in his own Christian life, that he had something standing in the way of him making the right decisions. And that was an old, that was an old nature. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 20, For there is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Even our best intentions are tainted with our old sin nature. And so that's one of the reasons that many today have no basis for their, for their anger management. They just end up losing it. And then they will make an excuse. Now, when their children lose it, they tell them to get over it, and they tell them to hug and kiss their, their brother or sister. And uh, I know one family that had a get-along T-shirt. And when their kids wouldn't get along with each other, they would put this T-shirt over both of them. And they had to keep it on until they got right with each other. It was really an amazing thing to see. And both heads would fit through the, through the neck part, and then one arm out one side and the other kid arm out the other side. And they made them wear it that way. But you know it's more, and we tell our children just get over it. You know, forgive one another, come out, shake hands, give one, give each other a kiss, which just makes them matter. But when an adult does that, they're just going through a phase. Got to let them get through it. You know, adults have more excuses than Carter had peanuts. Are you listening to me? The bottom line is simply this: the Bible teaches us that it's okay to be angry. In fact, it makes it very, it makes it biblically clear. Be angry, it says, and sin not. So we're not forbidden to be angry. But we are forbidden to have uncontrolled anger or wrath or whatever you would like to call it uh, that is not under the control uh, that it needs to be under. And so many believers today find themselves out of control when it comes to the matter of anger. And I know that this morning I'm speaking to someone either in this auditorium and or online with our online family who has had a terrible problem with their anger. And yet they say, my anger is justified and I've got every reason and you don't understand why I'm angry. Uh, but the bottom line is, listen, we have anger in our pulpits. We have anger in our pews. We have anger in our families. We have anger in our cars. We have anger on our television sets. We have anger in all these different areas. And we excuse it away out of our own lives when we, what we need to be doing is finding God's way of learning to keep calm and in every situation. Keep calm and. You see, everything's okay, for example, as long as the car is running. Let's hear it for as long as the car is running. Everything's okay as long as the oil's been changed on time. Everything is okay as long as there's gasoline in the tank or a fully charged battery, depending on what kind of a car you have. Everything is okay as long as there is food in the cabinets. It's all okay as long as there's some food in the refrigerator. Everything is okay as long as the bills are paid. All is well as long as the insurance is up to date. But let one thing go wrong and you find many of God's people are no longer calm and it's what are we going to do now? I want to address that today, biblically, if I may. I want you to notice with me again. Well, I'm going to say this before I say that. The filling of the Holy Spirit is all about who controls you. I used to think a long time ago that the filling of the Spirit was empty of yourself and full of him. And I found out later on that that's not at all what it's about. The filling of the Holy Spirit has to do with who controls you. The deaf, and my church family knows this, you folks are our guests today, but let me teach you something if I may. Uh, the deaf had it right all along for whatever the reasons may be, and I loved our deaf ministry that we had. And when I would preach on the filling of the Holy Spirit, our deaf interpreter, Jojo, she would hold her hands like this, like holding the reins of a horse. And to be filled with the Spirit, she would pull the reins back and forth. And I thought, well, what does that have to do with filling? It has everything to do with filling. Because what it means is to be under control of the Holy Spirit. Like you would pull the reins on a horse to turn them to the right, turn them to the left, or stop them, or make them go backwards. 
And as I thought about that, I thought maybe that's the reason so many of us are not controlled by the Holy Spirit. And here's what I say about that. If you control you or others control you, you will be out of control. However, the Holy Spirit of God, if he controls you, that is, if the Holy Spirit of God fills you, then you will not be out of control, but under his control. I've talked with many through the years. They'll be angry with somebody, and they'll spend all day with that individual, just over and over again, whatever they did to them. And they say, and I've said, I'm, I've said this to preachers. I say, they'll be angry at someone in their church, and I'll say, how much time have you spent with that individual today in your mind being angry at them? And hours of time. I said, so you have allowed that individual to control you all day long? That's not been the Holy Spirit. That's a, that has been you allowing somebody that you're angry with to control you. And that is nothing but wrong. But yet, it's not just preachers that do that. It's we lay people, you lay people, we preachers and you all. We all are guilty of that. Well, I think they, what's the old phrase? You end up stewing in it, allowing it to control you, staying awake at night thinking about it. I mean, how many people have you stayed awake at night thinking about it because you're so angry with them or a situation that they have brought into your life? That's called, look here now, that's called control. They're controlling every thought that goes through your head and through your heart. And so I want you to look again, if you would please, at Proverbs 19.11. Look at this truth. The discretion of a man disferreth his anger. So something fixes it. Am I wrong? Something will defer the anger. In other words, it will give it its proper place. It will defer it from that immediate judgment to a time or a place to where it can be properly done. Discretion will keep you from losing it. And if you are you prone to lose it? Is that one, something in your life? Are you prone to be one who is short-tempered, short-fused, uh, whatever it might be? Is that a propensity in your life? Is that something that controls you? I mean, who has kept you awake at night because you have thought over and over and over again about what they did or said or how they treated you in some way? You know what? I know I'm not perfect and I've never arrived, but I'll tell you this. That's a way I refuse to live. Life is too short. Life is too short to be controlled by that. All right, so what do we do here? There are steps to take to control your anger. This is not a lemon session. This is not a psychology class. I'm not going to give you something out of a book other than the word of God. But what can you do to be in control to where you could do this? Just keep calm and. Number one, be filled with the spirit. Ephesians 5.18 it's an admonition in the word of God. It is not a command, as some would say. It is an admonition. But it says, simply says this in Ephesians 5 and 18, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, why is it drunkenness and filling in the same thing? Because alcohol does what? Look here. Alcohol controls you. Well, that was the alcohol talking. That was the alcohol that made me do that. It was the alcohol that caused that in my family. I mean, you're saying the alcohol controlled you. So God says here, don't let alcohol control you. He says, but let the spirit control you. Don't give alcohol the reins of your life. Give the reins of your life to the Holy Spirit. And to be filled with the spirit, by the way, literally means to be controlled by the spirit. I have said I was preaching at a church up in Canada and there was a fellow there that had kind of an extreme view um, that I don't think he should have had. But I made him really, really mad when I used the illustration of the deaf about the controlling of the reins because he said I added something to the King James Bible. Really? Uh, that was kind of an odd thing. Uh, I read from it only, but this is what it means to be controlled. Made him so angry he stopped supporting that church that I was preaching in. Very interesting. It literally means to be controlled. And if you're not, you're not spiritual if you're, if you're out of control. Can I say that? You're not a spiritual individual if you are out of control. And often God can work around your lack of control, but God never chooses to work through your lack of control, you see. 
He can work around it, of course, because he can do anything. And everything about the Holy Spirit filling is about control. Now, listen carefully. No one throughout the whole of Scripture was out of control when he was filled with the Spirit. Can't find an illustration anywhere. You find people under a controlled life, what they were doing when they were filled with the Spirit. Nothing was done out of control. And in order to be filled and controlled with the Holy Spirit, you have to be, you have to, you must take the reins of your life and hand them to God and let Him be the one who calls the shots. It's, I'll say more about that in just a little bit. But with the, when was the last time you ever did that seriously, where you took the reins of your life, handed them to God, and said, okay, now you be in control? This is something I can't do. Even David, back in the Old Testament, when he became so deathly sick because he had chosen to do something God didn't want him to do, and, uh, and God gave him a choice of picking a switch, so to speak, and David simply said, just don't let me fall into the hands of a sinful man. But one of the things that he wrote around that was this. He said, my times are in thy hands. What did he mean? The times there weren't talking about his clock. It wasn't talking about his sundial. It wasn't talking about the watch on his wrist. He was talking about the areas of his life where he could not control it. He said, those things are in your hands. And he meant it. You see, to be filled with the Holy Spirit does not translate into being empty of yourself. And that's what we've always been taught. But it, what it has to do with is who controls you. And that's very, very important that we understand that. And it means that self is not involved at all. And is there a part of your life right now that you do not want God to control? You have to allow him to have the reins. And uh, uh, listen, uh, I've had to call um, every now and then, um, since we're living in a modern age, uh, we have a little bit of difficulty with the computer, and I have to learn something. Okay, now we've been doing it for a long time, so when I have to learn something, and my dad and I would do this, and my dad, when he got a computer, he asked me what kind he should get, not to get this kind because I can help you with it. When my dad would have a problem with the computer, I would say, okay, Dad, now I'm going to connect to your computer, and I want you to keep your hands off the mouse. How many know what I'm talking about? Don't touch the mouse. Because when I had control of his computer, I could move his mouse around, and I could click on anything I wanted to. And I did that with a preacher friend of mine just this week. And then a, a, a technician from Apple that I was talking with, he says, now, he says, let me have control of your Mac. And I let him have control of the Mac so that he could help me take care of something. If I touch the mouse, he doesn't have control. I'll, I'll try to move something, and he's trying to move it the other direction. My dad was real bad about that. He's in heaven now. He knows better. <laughs> yeah. and, but uh, my dad, uh, I'd say, now, Dad, don't touch the mouse because I'm going to be moving your mouse and it's going to be a temptation to take your hand and reach down and touch the mouse and want to move it someplace. I said, don't do that. So my dad would sit there very idly and then I would fix whatever was problem on his Mac and take care of it for him. And so he could not be involved at all other than giving me permission. And when he gave me permission, then I could fix the problem. So number one about controlling your anger and being calm, staying calm and was be filled with the Spirit. Number two, be filled with the Word of God. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16. Familiar verse to everybody in this room. You can quote it without even looking at it, but I want you to hear it in this context. The Bible says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. I think that's interesting because that word richly is a, is a picture word that God threw into the Bible for us to be able to see. And the word richly there is talking about an abundance overabundance of letting the word of God dwell in us. So let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Now look what it says, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. If you were to go back, and we're not going to go there right now, to Ephesians chapter 5, you would find 5.18 and beyond are almost word for word Colossians 3.16 and beyond. Now that teaches me one thing. To be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the Word of God because they have the same effect. In fact, why don't I, that's not really in my message today, but why don't we do that? I want you to just go to Ephesians chapter 5 very quickly, and let me just show you this. Some of you have never seen this. Others of you have seen it far too many times where it's become trite to you. Galatians, Ephesians Chapter 5, beginning in verse 18, notice what it says. 
It says, and be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now notice verse 19, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. These things do not fill you with the Spirit, by the way. These things are the result of being filled with the Spirit. Okay? It's been mistaught by, by many. They say, well, if you do these things, then you'll be filled with the Spirit. That's not what it says at all. It says, here be not drunk with wine, but where it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Then it says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another, and on and on it goes. Now, go to the book of Colossians, chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then the book of Colossians, chapter 3. And with the, what we just read in mind, look what it says. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Why? Submit yourselves unto your own husbands. As is fit in the Lord, husbands love your wives, and on it goes. And then you go to chapter, uh, you go to Ephesians chapter six, and it talks about children obeying their parents. It talks about employers, employees getting along with one another. All a result of being under the control of the Holy Spirit and not out of control. So to be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the Word of God, letting it dwell in you abundantly and richly in every area of your life. And you'll never know true Holy Spirit filling until you allow the Word of God to dwell in you richly. In order for the word of God to dwell in you richly, it has to dwell in you. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 8, the word of God says, This book of the law uh, shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. And he's talking about how the word of God has to be in us and a part of us. Meditate in it day and night that thou mayest do according to all that is written therein. And by the way, he didn't have Psalms then, and he did not have uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Acts and Romans and Revelation and any of the rest of them. He had the Pentateuch, if that. And he's talking here about the word of God being in them. We are admonished in Scripture to search the Scriptures daily and to study and to show ourselves approved unto God. And often there are those who feel led of the Holy Spirit who spend no time in God's Word and they're out of control. They make out of control decisions. You've heard me say often you cannot know the will of God if you do not know the Word of God. You cannot know the will of God if you do not know the Word of God. And if you do not know God's word, you cannot know God's will. And if you cannot know God's will, you'll be on your own. You'll be making decisions from your gut. You'll be making decisions from your feelings, making decisions on your how you are on a particular day, whether that be an up day or a down day or a medium day. It does not matter. You make a decision based upon that. Open mouth, insert foot. Or open mouth to change feet. Many years ago, when I studied, when we studied the book of Proverbs together here, this is something that I want to, I love to remind us of this. When we studied the book of Proverbs together, the word proverb itself means this. It means a governor. Now, when I was a kid, my brother put together go-karts and minibikes. And I was taking a lawnmower to Cumpsey or a Briggs and Stratton engine and mount it somehow or other on a little frame. And the first thing that my brother always did was he would break the governor off of the accelerator. Say, what was the governor? Governor was a little piece of metal that had been welded onto a place to where you could not pull the uh, gas feed any further past that because it might damage the engine, cause it to run out of control, and maybe possibly burn up. And I think it's interesting that God says, okay, here's the book of Proverbs, here's your governor. The word it literally means to, to rule, to rule. And God gave us Proverbs in our lives to keep us from running out of control and burning up and blowing up. That's what it's there for. And Proverbs is not just a bunch of sayings that are thrown together that we can take apart. They're given to us as governors in our lives. It's, listen, uh, the Proverbs are words, uh, they are words which are meant to rule and govern in our lives. And my brother always broke that off and usually burned up an engine. Anybody listening? And by the way, any boy worth his salt would take the, would take the governor off of the thing. Because he did. you've all gone go-karting before, and you, how many of you gotten stuck with the slow go-kart? And you're thinking, boy, if I had a pair of pliers, I'd take that governor off. I've been there. 
And then there's always that little girl that can't drive that drives all the way through the fence and past the hay stacks and the hay bales because hers was out of control, right? Yeah. We had one of those in our youth group at one time. Went right through the fence. And here's my car. I needed to take the governor off. And I don't know why they do that. I think they do that to frustrate youth directors or something. I don't know. So if you're going to control your anger, number one, be filled with the Spirit. Number two, be filled with the Word of God. Number three, being controlled by the Spirit and the Word of God will produce discretion. And that's what we read at the very beginning of the message today. Dis the, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger. And so number three, what I mean is this, is be con being controlled by the Spirit and the Word of God will produce discretion. And it is the discretion of a man which will keep him from flying off the handle and allow him to say, all right, be calm and just be calm. Yeah, but, no, yeah, but's about it. It's yes, be calm and. You see, but the, listen, Discretion is basically godly wisdom and understanding. That's how you get it. Discretion through godly wisdom and understanding. You get that from the word of God. Wise men and women who are controlled by the spirit of God and the word of God will control their anger. That's what they will do. Why? Because it's the word of God and the spirit of God that control their lives, not their own emotions, not their own feelings, not their circumstances in life, you see. Wise men and women controlled by the Spirit of God will control their anger. And by the way, there may be some who would blame their lack of control on others. Now listen, I, meant, I, I, I delved in this a moment ago, but don't miss this. Uh, but it's what that is, is an admission to being out of your, the control of the Holy Spirit and under the control of others. So if a person says, well, I, you just don't understand my circumstance. Well, I may not understand everything about your circumstance. How could I? But I know the word of God says discretion, discretion and the word of God are going to keep you from losing it. And it, if I may, let me lift a verse from its immediate context, okay? Because I want to apply a principle that is found in it. And that's 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. Let me show you what I'm talking about. And if you have your Bible, you can go there. If you don't know where 1 Peter is, find 2 Peter and go back one book, and it'll be right there waiting for you to get there. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 33 and 34, he said, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto thee. And did you hear the admonition? Teach me, I'll keep it. The next verse says, Give me understanding, and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Why? Understanding. Get taught, get understanding. It's amazing how it goes together. The key to obedience is understanding. You can't, you can't obey what you don't understand. Does that make sense? The Bible says here, for example, 1 Peter 3, 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. There's so many sermons that can come out of this one verse. But there's a key phrase I want you to notice in there. It says, dwell with them according to knowledge. People say, well, I just don't understand my life. I saw a joke the other day that said, the newest book that's out on understanding women, it was this thick. And I thought, well, that's a sad commentary, the truth of the matter. The same thing's true about men. That's the sequel to it. Now, I just don't understand my husband. All right? The Bible says, likewise, your husbands dwell with them according to knowledge. It's interesting that the Bible says about wives and husbands, it says for the husband to be not bitter against them. That must mean that there's something that could make the husband bitter against them. Why else would the admonition be there? The key is found in understanding. Understanding. You see, sometimes people fight with one another simply because they don't understand one another. I just don't understand you anymore. You don't understand what I'm saying. You don't know where I'm coming from. It's time to understand where they're coming from. It'll avoid a lot of fights and a lot of not getting along. Most fights in families are not over right and wrong. Did you hear what I said? Most fights in families are not over right or wrong, but because of a lack of understanding of one another. Now, I know what you meant. 
No, you don't. I know what you're thinking. No, you don't. You, can't, you might be somewhere near right, but the bottom line is you need to get understanding so you can get along with one another. Now let's go back to 1 Peter again in chapter 3 and verse 7 with that understanding. <laughs> with that understanding. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker, not worse or lesser. Notice that. Unto the weaker vessel. And as being heirs together, the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Dr. John Rice preached a sermon, and one of his points was about hindered prayer. And one of the points was on this husbands and wives getting along with one another. And I mentioned a while ago, there's a lot of anger in our homes today. Husbands against wives, wives against husbands, they're toward each other. Parents toward their children, children toward their parents, children toward each other. A lot of anger that's in our homes today needs to be squelched. Just keep calm and... Number one, be filled with the Spirit. Number two, be filled with the Word of God. And number three, understand that those two things together are going to pull together and they are going to allow you to defer your anger. Learning how to deal with people is, is perhaps one of the hardest things that most people do. It's just hard to get along. Husbands want wives to, to love them like they love their wives. And wives want husbands to love them like they love their husbands. And children want parents to understand their problems. And parents often refuse to understand their children's problems and handle situations simply by losing it or go ask your father. Understand what I'm saying here. There's a key to keeping your anger. There's a key to not losing it. And if I read my Bible correctly, that key, though, you say you're making it too simple. Really? Would you like to make it harder than that? Do you want me to give you a 10-step program on how to control your anger? The Bible says this very, very plainly, and let me just read it to you again. It says, plainly, the discretion of a man deferreth his anger. So that must be the answer. Not a 10-step program of how to give something up or how to do this or whatever, but, but having the wisdom that the Word of God gives. Sadly, though, today in most families, the Word of God is a closed book. It's not read, studied, or taken care of. Many, uh, there's, in churches today, you go to many churches today, and though uh, some Bible is preached, a lot of times the Bible is closed. And I remember my good buddy Ron and I went to a church in southern Indiana, actually, one time. And uh, not southern, where was it at? And no, it wasn't southern Indiana. It's just above Indianapolis is where it was. And I thought we were going to get a good solid Bible message. <laughs> we ended up with a mini country western concert and a rock concert on the piano, and a, a three-point psychological message. I looked at my buddy Ron, and I said, why did we even come here tonight? Is there a reason we showed up? Well, I can't think of a reason other than to say that I'm not going to preach like that. Now, Proverbs 19.11 tells us how to keep calm with any situation that may come up, and before you fly off the handle, remember that wisdom and understanding will delay that angle. It will defer that anger. Many people, their mouth is engaged before their brain is. You need to think through things. There may be a reason for this. Be careful not to allow the situations in life to cause you to blow up in a fit of uncontrolled anger. Anger should never be impulsive, but should be, always be on purpose. I had a pastor one time, in his sermon notes, he would put in there, when to raise his voice. <laughs> Talk about a controlled sermon. He'd say, raise voice here. <laughs> Talk quiet here. And I thought, well, you say, well, he should have been led of the Spirit. Well, who's to say that wasn't being led of the Spirit? And I thought, I didn't, you'd never know that to hear him preach. But in his notes, he would put down there when he wanted to emphasize a point and how he wanted to do it. And I thought that was pretty good. So let me ask you a personal question. Okay, I'm going to close. And I realize this is not a typical Sunday morning uh, preacher sermon. It's just not. But then again, nothing is typical for necessarily any situation in any service. But the question I want to ask you personally is this. Do you have a problem with managing your anger? The first thing you've got to do is admit it, of course. But secondly, you've got to do this. You've got to say, yeah, I've got a problem with that. Now, what do I do about it? The Lord of God has it. Now, do you have a difficult time keeping calm? And if I read my Bible correctly, and I believe that I do, it has little to do with your personality. The color of your hair, the ethnicity of your family, or anything else, it has to do with what the Word of God says. 
It has nothing to do with red hair, nationality, ethnic origin, or anything else. It has to do with discretion that comes from the Word of God. And if I read my Bible correctly, and I believe that I do, that's not a 10-step program. So the verses that I gave you today, first of all, was when you're out of control, be controlled by the Spirit. When you're out of control, number two, be controlled with the Word of God. And number three, those two items, those two items will give you discretion enough to control your angry. No husband should look at his wife and say, why are you so angry with me? No wife should look at her husband and say, why are you so angry with me? It should be under control. And our Heavenly Father, I want to thank you today for...